Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, really getting into Pi cryptocurrency. Yeah, it's designed supposedly for everyday people. We've got the white papers to dig through. Exactly. We've got the original from March 2019 and then that December 2021 addendum, you know, with the updated rewards formula from March 22. So our plan is to really unpack what Pi is trying to fix, uh, their unique angle on crypto and their, well, pretty big vision for the future. Right. We want to get into the core concepts, the solutions they're proposing, and, you know, what makes Pi different in this, let's face it, very crowded crypto space. OK, so let's start with the problem they outline. Yeah, the white paper really kicks off talking about the issues with, well, the traditional financial system, our reliance on banks, PayPal, the middlemen. Trusted intermediaries, as they call them. And yeah. while sure, they're essential in many ways, the paper points out some real downsides. Like what exactly? Well, think about unfair value capture. You know, these big companies making huge profits from the system, but maybe not giving much back to the users who make it work. Hmm. Yeah. And fees, obviously. Always fees. Right. Fees, censorship. They can block your transaction, permission to access, meaning not everyone gets to play. And privacy concerns. They hold so much of our data. Exactly. That's the backdrop. Then came the first cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin. Offering that decentralized dream you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, no middleman. Precisely. Bitcoin's big thing was the distributed ledger. Everyone keeps a copy validated by this network of users, not one single bank. And that brought benefits, right? Security, supposedly unseizable assets. Yeah, censorship resistance, immutability. Once it's there, it's there. Plus the potential for smart contracts, which was uh, pretty revolutionary. But Bitcoin's method, that proof-of-work mining, the white paper flags that as a problem too. It does. Proof-of-work is secure, no doubt. But it needs incredible amounts of computing power. Which means tons of electricity. Massive amounts. And this has led to, well, centralization, again, just in a different form. Power and wealth concentrated in the hands of big mining operations. The paper mentions a stat, something like 87% of Bitcoin owned by just 1% of the network. Something like that, yeah. It highlights that concentration. And for the average person, getting into Bitcoin mining requires expensive, specialized hardware. So it's not really accessible for most people, the cost, the risk, it's a huge barrier. It really is. The investment, the energy bills, it kind of shuts out everyday folks from participating in securing the network and earning rewards that way. And that's the problem Pi says it wants to solve. Exactly. Which leads us to their solution, this idea of mobile first mining. OK, mining on your phone sounds easier. But how do they deal with that energy issue? Bitcoin mining takes warehouses of computers. Right. So they needed a different way for the network to agree on transactions, a different consensus algorithm, one that's user friendly and crucially planet friendly. And they landed on. They adopted the Stellar Consensus Protocol, or SCP. It was developed by David Mazares at Stanford. The SCP. OK, how does that work? Is it still like mining? Not in the proof of work sense. Mm -hmm. SCP uses something called Federated Byzantine Agreements, FBA. Federated Byzantine Agreements. OK, break that down. Basically, instead of everyone competing to solve a puzzle like in Bitcoin, each computer, or node, running the Pi software, chooses its own small group of other nodes that it trusts. They call this a quorum slice. So I trust you, you trust her, she trusts him. Like that. <laughs> kind of, yeah. You define your own trusted circle. And for a transaction to be confirmed, enough overlapping trusted circles, these quorums need to agree on it. Ah, so the consensus emerges from these interconnected trust choices, not from burning electricity. Exactly. No central authority and no massive energy drain. It's a different philosophy. And Pi added its own twist to this. Yeah, their key innovation is layering a trust graph on top of SCP. This graph is actively built by the users themselves. How? Through the contributor role. Users provide lists of other pioneers. That's the basic user role, who they personally trust. This creates a global web of trust. And this trust graph influences how the actual network nodes operate. That's the idea. It helps inform how the nodes, the computers running the core software, configure their connections, and who they decide to include in their crucial quorum slices. That's actually quite clever, weaving social trust into the technical security. It's a very interesting approach. The white paper mentions four user roles. You said Pioneer is the basic one. Right. And Pi considers all these roles miners in a broad mm. sense because they all contribute and get rewarded daily with new Pi. OK, so who are they? First, the Pioneer. That's just someone who opens the app daily to prove they're human, not a bot. Simple okay. engagement. OK. Then the contributor. We just mentioned them. They build the trust graph by listing pioneers they trust. Got it. Third, 
the ambassador. Their role is bringing new people into the network, basically referrals. Makes sense for growth. And finally, the node. This is someone running the actual PyNode software on a computer, participating in the SCP consensus using that trust graph information. And one person can be multiple things, like a pioneer who also contributes and runs a node. Absolutely. You can wear multiple hats. And the reward system is different, too. How so? Not per block. No. Pi calculates rewards for everyone just once a day. The aim is for a more uh, meritocratic distribution based on your contributions across these roles rather than a race for the next block reward. It tries to avoid the need for those big mining pools you see in Bitcoin. What about transaction fees? Does Pi have them? Yes, but they're designed to be optional, mostly. If the network's busy, transactions with a fee get prioritized. And where do those fees go? They get collected and then distributed proportionally among all the active nodes daily. Another incentive to run a node. Okay, so Pi adapts SCP. The white paper mentions that Stellar mostly involves companies running nodes, but Pi wants individuals, even on phones or laptops, right? Yeah, that's a big part of their vision and a technical challenge. They want protocol-level participation from everyday devices. How are they planning to make that work? Running a node sounds complicated. Well, the Pi Node software, which they say will be open source and built on Stellar's core code, uses that trust graph data we talked about. It's meant to help nodes configure themselves, figure out who to trust for consensus. Are they providing tools to help regular users with this? That's the plan. They talk about providing tools like ranked lists of trusted nodes based on the graph, lists of potentially faulty nodes, ways to see new nodes joining. Visualizations, maybe? Yeah, visualizations of the network, a tool to explore quorums, even a simulation tool to see how changing your settings might impact things. They want to make it manageable. So trying to lower the barrier to entry for running the network's infrastructure. Definitely. And they're even researching algorithms to help automate node configuration based on the trust graph eventually. What about the average user, the pioneer, just using the mobile app? How do they interact with this? The mobile app connects to several nodes. It needs to check the transactions are recorded correctly and get the latest blockchain state. Does it connect to random nodes? It'll have a default set based on trust graph proximity and a page rank like score. Yeah. And if you happen to run your own node, your app will naturally prioritize connecting to that one. Okay, so it's this layered system. Social trust feeds into node configuration, which secures the network. Let's shift to the economics. Bitcoin, fixed supply, 21 million. Pi. Different approach. They're trying to balance scarcity with getting it into lots of hands. The total max supply is defined, but by a formula. M plus R plus D. M, R, D. What are those? M is mining rewards, mm. R is referral rewards, and D is developer rewards. And the mining part M isn't fixed. No, it's designed to decrease logarithmically based on how many people join up to the first 100 million users. How does that work? For every person who joins within that first 100 million, a certain fixed amount of pie is sort of pre-minted or allocated but it's only released to them over their lifetime based on their engagement and contribution. The early joiners get access to potentially more pie over time. Yes, the model rewards early members more heavily based on the idea that they provide more value when the network is small and needs to grow. Okay, and R, referral rewards. That's purely to incentivize growth. Both the referrer and the new person get a bonus cool of pie they can mine together as long as both stay active. Trying to encourage real connections, not just signups. Used to be the goal. Okay. And D, developer rewards. That's minted alongside the other rewards. It's basically funding for ongoing development, trying to align the core team's incentives with the network's overall health. So a dynamic model trying to balance growth, early contribution, and long-term supply. Now, Pi wants to be more than just money, right? This ecosystem idea. Absolutely. They talk about the Pi stack. It's their vision for a peer-to-peer -peer ecosystem. What's in the stack? The foundation is the Pi Ledger and Shared Trust Graph. That's the base for secure transactions and building trust between strangers. Makes sense, using their core tech. Yeah. What else? Then there's Pi's Attention Marketplace. This is pretty out there. The idea is members could use Pi to get attention from others, maybe for posts or content. Or you could opt in to see ads and get paid in Pi for your attention. Hmm, taking on the attention economy. Mm. That's ambitious. <laughs> How would that realistically compete with existing social media? That's the big question, isn't it? Maybe the incentive of earning Pi directly is the hook. But yeah, network effects are powerful. It's a challenge. What's next in the stack? Pi's barter marketplace. This is more concrete. 
Members offering goods and services think skills, freelance work, maybe even physical items directly to other Pi users, paid in Pi. Like a decentralized eBay or Fiverr, but using Pi. Kind of, yeah. Setting up virtual storefronts within the Pi ecosystem. Again, challenges there. Building trust, ensuring quality, handling disputes in a decentralized way. Have other crypto projects tried similar marketplaces effectively? Some have tried, with varying success. Often usability and reaching critical mass are hurdles. Pi hopes its large user base gives it an edge. And the last piece of the stack. Pi's decentralized app store. They want to make it easy for developers to build apps using Pi's infrastructure, mm. the currency, the trust graph, maybe the marketplaces, and reach the Pi community. Lowering the barrier for dApp development, specifically for their ecosystem. Exactly. So it's a whole suite. Currency, trust, attention, commerce, and apps. Oh, okay, quite a vision. How do they plan to govern this whole thing as it grows? Governance is always tricky in decentralized projects. They acknowledge it's a social problem and are taking it slow in two phases. That's phase one. When they had under 5 million members, they used a provisional governance model, kind of like Bitcoin or Ethereum's early days off-chain governance. The core team guides things, but heavily relies on community feedback through the app, comments, meetups, etc. So centralized guidance, but listening to the community. Right. They also floated the idea of liquid democracy down the line. Liquid democracy. What's that? It's where you can either vote directly on proposals or delegate your vote to someone you trust to vote for you. Kind of flexible. Interesting. And phase two, after 5 million members? They plan for a constitutional convention. Basically, form a temporary committee to gather ideas globally, online and offline, to draft a long-term constitution or governance framework for Pi. So a more formalized, community-driven process to set up the long-term rule. Exactly. Let it evolve. Right. Now, the roadmap. They laid out three phases. Right. Phase one was the beta. Yep. <laughs> Started late 2018, mobile app launch, official white paper launch March 2019. This was all about getting pioneers on board, mining by checking in daily, building those initial security circles. They got over 3.5 million users then. Just based on the promise in the app. Pretty much. Then phase two, testnet launched March 2020. This is where the Node software came in. Exactly. People could run nodes on their computers using TestPy on a test blockchain. Focus was on testing decentralization, growing the network further, and starting to build utility with the Pi apps platform and Pi browser. I got a lot of nodes running, right? Yeah, over 10,000 community nodes, and the user base grew past 30 million engaged pioneers. Which leads us to phase three, mainnet, the live blockchain. Launch December 2021. Correct. But this phase itself has two parts. First, the enclosed network. Enclosed, meaning what? It's the live mainnet, but with a firewall up. It prevents connections to outside blockchains or exchanges. Why do that? It gives time for things to stabilize. People need to pass KYC, know your customer. They need to migrate their mind Pi to the mainnet. Developers need time to build and test Pi apps within the ecosystem. And the core team can make adjustments before opening the floodgates. So a walled garden phase to get things ready. You can use Pi, but only inside the Pi ecosystem. Pretty much. Transactions between pioneers using Pi apps on the Pi browser, but no cashing out to Bitcoin or fiat currency yet. Core team nodes maintain that firewall initially. And the second part of phase three. The open network. That's when the firewall comes down. External connectivity is allowed to other blockchains, exchanges. Pioneers can run their own mainnet nodes. APIs open up. When does that happen? The timing depends on how the enclosed network matures, how many people pass KYC. They mentioned potential dates like Pi Day or Pi 2 Day in 2022, but it's conditional. Okay, makes sense. Now, that December 2021 addendum also updated the token model and mining for mainnet. A big change was the total supply, wasn't it? Huge change. They set a clear maximum total supply, 100 billion pi. Before mainnet, it was more ambiguous, tied to user growth. Now it's capped. 100 billion. How's that split up? 80% goes to the community, 20% to the pi core team. And the community's 80%. It's broken down further. 65 billion for mining rewards, past and future. 10 billion for organizing the community and ecosystem building via a future pi foundation. And 5 billion for liquidity pools when they hit exchanges. Okay, quite detailed. And the mining formula itself changed for mainnet too. Yeah, the focus shifted. Less about just growing the network, more about rewarding different kinds of contributions that build the ecosystem and utility. So it got more complex than just logging in and having referrals. Definitely. The new formula is M-A-I-B-L-S plus E-I plus N-I plus A-I plus X-B. Looks complicated, but the key is the new parts. Okay. What are the big new ideas in there? 
While the system-wide base mining rate, B, isn't fixed anymore, it adjusts dynamically each month based on a supply cap and how much everyone is earning to keep issuance predictable. More adaptive. What about individual rewards? The individual rate, I, now includes a lockup reward. You can choose to lock up some of your pie for a period, say, six months, a year, three years, and you get a higher mining rate for doing so. Ah, uh, incentivizing holding and long-term commitment. What else? There's an app usage reward. <laughs> you earn more pie by actually using apps on the pie browser. This directly encourages utility creation and gives developers an active audience. Makes sense. Rewarding actual use. And a node reward, N. This rewards people running nodes based on uptime, connectivity, CPU contribution, crucial for decentralization. So rewarding the infrastructure providers. Exactly. And they even left room for future rewards X for new kinds of contributions they haven't defined yet. The referral E and security circle S rewards are still there, similar to before. So a much more multifaceted reward system now. And you mentioned KYC being crucial for mainnet. Absolutely essential. Only KYC verified pioneers can transfer their mobile mind balance to the mainnet. What happens if you don't do KYC? There's a rolling six-month grace period once KYC is widely available. If you miss that window for PyMine previously, you might lose it. That unclaimed Pi could potentially be reallocated back into the mining reward pool. Why is KYC so strict here? Primarily to enforce the one-person, one-account rule. Given the social mining aspect, preventing fake accounts and bots from gaming the system is critical for fairness and integrity. Right, it underpins the whole trust graph and reward mechanism. So. Looking back at everything, Pi is definitely taking a different path. It really is. It's a unique proposition. Mobile first mining for accessibility, aiming for wide distribution, using this novel trust graph for consensus, it stands apart. And the focus on building a utility ecosystem before opening up fully to exchanges is also quite distinctive. Yeah, that phased mainnet launch in closed then open is a very deliberate strategy. Plus, the evolving economic model with dynamic rates, lockups, usage rewards, it feels designed for the long haul, aiming for sustainability and real use cases. What really stands out to you is something for listeners to chew on. Well, just the core idea, mining crypto on your phone. It's still a radical departure from the usual image of mining. Very different. Yeah, the accessibility angle is key. And the trust graph concept, using social connections to secure a blockchain. That's fascinating territory. Also, the attention marketplace idea, could we really capture value from our own online attention? It's provocative. It definitely makes you think differently about online value exchange. And finally, that controlled mainnet rollout. It's cautious, maybe even slow, compared to some projects, but it suggests a focus on getting the fundamentals right, KYC, apps, stability, before hitting the open market. It raises big questions, doesn't it? Could a crypto truly build for everyday people, actually make a dent in global finance, or empower individuals economically? Huge questions, and the challenges are massive too. Building that ecosystem, getting developers on board, ensuring the tech scales, maintaining decentralization as it grows, it's definitely a project to watch. Its success hinges on community, tech, and whether that utility vision becomes reality. For sure. So if this has piqued your interest, you might want to dig deeper into Pi Network yourself. Check out their recent updates. See what the community is saying. Form your own view on its potential. Definitely food for thought. Thanks for taking this deep dive with us today.